Geoffrey Chaucer, known as the father of English literature, is widely considered the greatest English poet of the Middle Ages and was the first poet to be buried in Poets' Corner of Westminster Abbey. While he achieved fame during his lifetime as an author, philosopher, and astronomer, composing a scientific treatise on the astrolabe for his ten-year-old son Lewis, Chaucer also maintained an active career in the civil service as a bureaucrat, courtier and diplomat. Among his many works, which include The Book of the Duchess, The House of Fame, The Legend of Good Women and Troilus and Cressida, he is best known today for the Canterbury Tales. Chaucer was a crucial figure in developing the legitimacy of the vernacular, Middle English. At a time when the dominant literary languages in England were French and Latin, life. Geoffrey Chaucer was born in London sometime around 1343, though the precise date and location of his birth remain unknown. His father and grandfather were both London vintners. Several previous generations had been merchants in Ipswich. In 1324 John Chaucer, Geoffrey's father, was kidnapped by an aunt in the hope of marrying the 12-year-old boy to her daughter in an attempt to keep property in Ipswich. The aunt was imprisoned and the £250 fine levied suggests that the family was financially secure, bourgeois, if not elite. John Chaucer married Agnes Copton, who, in 1349, inherited properties, including 24 shops in London from her uncle, Hamo de Copton, who is described in a will dated 3 April 1354 and listed in the city hustings roll as Munnier. He was said to be Munnier at the Tower of London. In the city hustings roll 110, 5, Rick 2, dated June 1380, Geoffrey Chaucer referred to himself as Miguel Fridham Chaucer, Philium Johannes Chaucer, Vinitri I, Londony, while records concerning the lives of his contemporary poets William Langland and the Pearl Poet are practically non-existent. Since Chaucer was a public servant, his official life is very well documented, with nearly 500 written items testifying to his career. The first of the Chaucer life records appears in 1357, in the household accounts of Elizabeth de Berg, the Countess of Ulster, when he became the noblewoman's page through his father's connections a common medieval form of apprenticeship for boys into knighthood or prestige appointments. The Countess was married to Lionel, Duke of Clarence, the second surviving son of the King, Edward III, and the position brought the teenage Chaucer into the close court circle, where he was to remain for the rest of his life. He also worked as a courtier, a diplomat, and a civil servant, as well as working for the king from 1389 to 1391 as clerk of the king's works. In 1359, in the early stages of the Hundred Years' War, Edward III invaded France and Chaucer travelled with Lionel of Antwerp, first Duke of Clarence. Elizabeth's husband, as part of the English army. In 1360, he was captured during the Siege of Reims. Edward paid £16 for his ransom, a considerable sum, and Chaucer was released. After this, Chaucer's life is uncertain, but he seems to have travelled in France, Spain, and Flanders, possibly as a messenger and perhaps even going on a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. Around 1366, Chaucer married Philippa Rode. She was a lady-in-waiting to Edward III's queen, Philippa of Hainaut, and a sister of Catherine Swinford, who later became the third wife of John of Gaunt. It is uncertain how many children Chaucer and Philippa had, but three or four are most commonly cited. His son, Thomas Chaucer, had an illustrious career as chief butler to four kings, envoy to France, and speaker of the House of Commons. Thomas's daughter, Alice, married the Duke of Suffolk. Thomas's great-grandson, John de la Pole, Earl of Lincoln, was the heir to the throne designated by Richard III before he was deposed. Geoffrey's other children probably included Elizabeth Chaucy, a nun at Barking Abbey, Agnes, an attendant at Henry IV's coronation, and another son, Louis Chaucer.
Chaucer's treatise on the astrolabe was written for Lewis. According to tradition, Chaucer studied law in the Inner Temple at this time. He became a member of the royal court of Edward III as a varlet de chamber, Joman, or a squire on 20 June 1367, a position which could entail a wide variety of tasks. His wife also received a pension for court employment. He traveled abroad many times, at least some of them in his role as a valet. In 1368, he may have attended the wedding of Lionel of Antwerp to Violante Visconti, daughter of Galeazzo II Visconti, in Milan. Two other literary stars of the era were in attendance. Jean Froissart and Petrarch. Around this time, Chaucer is believed to have written the Book of the Duchess in honor of Blanche of Lancaster, the late wife of John of Gaunt, who died in 1369. Chaucer traveled to Picardy the next year as part of a military expedition. In 1373, he visited Genoa and Florence. Numerous scholars such as Skeet, Boitani, and Roland suggested that, on this Italian trip, he came into contact with Petrarch or Boccaccio. They introduced him to medieval Italian poetry, the forms and stories of which he would use later. The purposes of a voyage in 1377 are mysterious, as details within the historical record conflict. Later documents suggest it was a mission, along with Jean Froissart, to arrange a marriage between the future King Richard II and French princess, thereby ending the Hundred Years' War. If this was the purpose of their trip, they seem to have been unsuccessful, as no wedding occurred. In 1378, Richard II sent Chaucer as an envoy to the Visconti and to Sir John Hawkwood, English condottiere in Milan. It has been speculated that it was Hawkwood on whom Chaucer based his character the knight in the Canterbury Tales, for a description matches that of a 14th-century condottiere. A possible indication that his career as a writer was appreciated came when Edward III granted Chaucer a gallon of wine daily for the rest of his life, for some unspecified task. This was an unusual grant, but given on a day of celebration, St. George's Day, 1374, when artistic endeavors were traditionally rewarded. It is assumed to have been another early poetic work. It is not known which, if any, of Chaucer's extant works prompted the reward, but the suggestion of him as poet to a king places him as a precursor to later poets laureate. Chaucer continued to collect the liquid stipend until Richard II came to power, after which it was converted to a monetary grant on 18 April 1378. Chaucer obtained the very substantial job of controller of the customs for the Port of London, which he began on 8 June 1374. He must have been suited for the role as he continued in it for 12 years, a long time in such a post at that time. His life goes undocumented for much of the next 10 years, but it is believed that he wrote most of his famous works during this period. He was mentioned in law papers of the 4th of May 1380, involved in the raptus of Cecilia Champagne. What raptus means is unclear, but the incident seems to have been resolved quickly and did not leave a stain on Chaucer's reputation. It is not known if Chaucer was in the city of London at the time of the Peasants' Revolt, but if he was, he would have seen its leaders pass almost directly under his apartment window at Aldgate. While still working as controller, Chaucer appears to have moved to Kent being appointed as one of the commissioners of peace for Kent. At a time when French invasion was a possibility, he is thought to have started work on the Canterbury Tales in the early 1380s. He also became a member of Parliament for Kent in 1386. On 15 October that year, he gave a deposition in the case of Scrope v. Grosvenor. There is no further reference after this date to Philippa, Chaucer's wife, and she is presumed to have died in 1387. He survived the political upheavals caused by the Lord's appellants. Despite the fact that Chaucer knew some of the men executed over the affair quite well, on 12 July 1389, Chaucer was appointed the clerk of the King's Works, a sort of foreman organizing most of the King's building projects. 
No major works were begun during his tenure, but he did conduct repairs on Westminster Palace, St. George's Chapel, Windsor, continue building the wharf at the Tower of London, and build the stands for a tournament held in 1390. It may have been a difficult job, but it paid well. Two shillings a day, more than three times his salary as a controller. Chaucer was also appointed keeper of the lodge at the King's Park in Feckenham, which was a largely honorary appointment. In September 1390, records say that he was robbed, and possibly injured, while conducting the business, and it was shortly after, on 17 June 1391, that he stopped working in this capacity. Almost immediately, on the 22nd of June, he began as deputy forester in the Royal Forest of Pedderton Park in North Pedderton, Somerset. This was no sinecure, with maintenance an important part of the job, although there were many opportunities to derive profit. He was granted an annual pension of £20 by Richard II in 1394. It is believed that Chaucer stopped work on the Canterbury Tales sometime towards the end of this decade, not long after the overthrow of his patron, Richard II, in 1399. Chaucer's name fades from the historical record. The last few records of his life show his pension renewed by the new king and his taking of a lease on a residence within the close of Westminster Abbey on 24 December 1399. Although Henry IV renewed the grants assigned to Chaucer by Richard, Chaucer's own the complaint to Chaucer to his purse hints that the grants might not have been paid. The last mention of Chaucer is on 5 June 1400, when some monies owed to him were paid. He is believed to have died of unknown causes on 25 October 1400, but there is no firm evidence for this date, as it comes from the engraving on his tomb, erected more than 100 years after his death. There is some speculation, most recently in Terry Jones' book Who Murdered Chaucer? A Medieval Mystery, that he was murdered by enemies of Richard II or even on the orders of his successor Henry IV, but the case is entirely circumstantial. Chaucer was buried in Westminster Abbey in London, as was his right owing to his status as a tenant of the Abbey's close. In 1556, his remains were transferred to a more ornate tomb, making Chaucer the first writer interred in the area now known as Poet's Corner. Relationship to John of Gaunt Chaucer was a close friend of and served under the patronage of John of Gaunt, the wealthy Duke of Lancaster. Near the end of their lives Lancaster and Chaucer became brothers-in-law. Chaucer married Philippa de Rote in 1366, and Lancaster took his mistress of nearly 30 years, Catherine Swinford, who was Philippa Chaucer's sister, as his third wife in 1396. Although Philippa died c. 1387, the men were bound as brothers and Lancaster's children by Catherine, John, Henry, Thomas and Joan Beaufort were Chaucer's nephews and niece. Chaucer's book of the Duchess, also known as The Death of Blanche the Duchessa, was written in commemoration of Blanche of Lancaster, John of Gaunt's first wife. The poem refers to John and Blanche in allegory as the narrator relates the tale of a long castell with Wallace White B. St. Johann, on a right hill, who is mourning grievously after the death of his love, and good fair white she het, that was my lady name right. The phrase, Long Castell, is a reference to Lancaster, Wallace White, is thought to likely be an oblique reference to Blanche. Saint Johann, was John of Gaunt's name Saint, and, Rychill, is a reference to Richmond. These thinly veiled references reveal the identity of the grieving Black Knight of the poem as John of Gaunt. Duke of Lancaster and Earl of Richmond, white, is the English translation of the French word, Blanche, implying that the white lady was Blanche of Lancaster. Believed to have been written in the 1390s, Chaucer's short poem Fortune, is also inferred to directly reference Lancaster. Chaucer as narrator, openly defies fortune, proclaiming he has learned who his enemies are through her tyranny and deceit and declares, My suffer sorns, and that, over himself hath the maestry. Fortune, in turn, does not understand Chaucer's harsh words to her for she believes she has been kind to him. 
claims that he does not know what she has in store for him in the future, but most importantly, and eke thou hast thy best friend alive. Chaucer retorts that, my friend Maystow Nat Revan, blind goddessa, and orders her to take away those who merely pretend to be his friends. Fortune turns her attention to three princes whom she implores to relieve Chaucer of his pain and prayeth his best friend of his noblesse, that to Sombita estate he may attend her. The three princes are believed to represent the Dukes of Lancaster, York, and Gloucester, and a portion of Line 76, as three of you or twain, to refer to the Ordinance of 1390 which specified that no royal gift could be authorized without the consent of at least two of the three dukes. Most conspicuous in this short poem is the number of references to Chaucer's best friend. Fortune states three times in her response to the plaintiff, and also, you still have your best friend alive. She also references his best friend in the envoy when appealing to his noblesse to help Chaucer to a higher estate. A fifth reference is made by Chaucer as narrator, who rails at Fortune that she shall not take his friend from him while the envoy playfully hints to Lancaster that Chaucer would certainly appreciate a boost to his status or income. The poem Fortune distinctively shows his deep appreciation and affection for John of Gaunt. Works Chaucer's first major work, The Book of the Duchess, was an elegy for Blanche of Lancaster. It is possible that this work was commissioned by her husband John of Gaunt, as he granted Chaucer a £10 annuity on 13 June 1374. This would seem to place the writing of the Book of the Duchess between the years 1369 and 1374. Two other early works by Chaucer were Anna Leda and Arcite and the House of Fame. Chaucer wrote many of his major works in a prolific period when he held the job of customs controller for London. His Parliament of Fowlis, The Legend of Good Women and Troilus and Crusader all date from this time. It is believed that in the early 1380s he started the work for which he is best known, The Canterbury Tales, a collection of stories told by fictional pilgrims on the road to the cathedral at Canterbury, tales that would help to shape English literature. The Canterbury Tales contrasts with other literature of the period in the naturalism of its narrative. The variety of stories the pilgrims tell and the varied characters who are engaged in the pilgrimage. Many of the stories narrated by the pilgrims seem to fit their individual characters and social standing. Although some of the stories seem ill-fitting to their narrators, perhaps as a result of the incomplete state of the work, Chaucer drew on real life for his cast of pilgrims. The innkeeper shares the name of a contemporary keeper of an inn in Southwark, and real-life identities for the wife of Bath, the merchant, the man of law and the student have been suggested. The many jobs that Chaucer held in medieval society, page, soldier, messenger, valet, bureaucrat, foreman and administrator, probably exposed him to many of the types of people he depicted in the tales. He was able to shape their speech and satirize their manners in what was to become popular literature among people of the same types. Chaucer's works are sometimes grouped into first a French period, then an Italian period and finally an English period, with Chaucer being influenced by those countries' literatures in turn. Certainly Troilus and Crusader is a middle period work with its reliance on the forms of Italian poetry, little known in England at the time, but to which Chaucer was probably exposed during his frequent trips abroad on court business. In addition, its use of a classical subject and its elaborate, courtly language sets it apart as one of his most complete and well-formed works. In Troilus and Crusader Chaucer draws heavily on his source, Boccaccio, and on the late Latin philosopher Boethius. However, it is the Canterbury Tales, wherein he focuses on English subjects, with bawdy jokes and respected figures often being undercut with humour, that has cemented his reputation. Chaucer also translated such important works as Boethius' A Consolation of Philosophy and the Romance of the Rose by Guillaume de Loris. 
However, while many scholars maintain that Chaucer did indeed translate part of the text of Roman de la Rose as the Roman of the Rose, others claim that this has been effectively disproved. Many of his other works were very loose translations of, or simply based on, works from continental Europe. It is in this role that Chaucer receives some of his earliest critical praise. Eustache de Champ wrote a ballad on the great translator and called himself a nettle in Chaucer's Garden of Poetry. In 1385 Thomas Usk made glowing mention of Chaucer, and John Gower, Chaucer's main poetic rival of the time, also lauded him. This reference was later edited out of Gower's Confessio Amantis and it was suggested by one editor that this was done because of ill feeling between them but it is likely due simply to stylistic concerns. One other significant work of Chaucer's is his treatise on the astrolabe, possibly for his own son, that describes the form and use of that instrument in detail and is sometimes cited as the first example of technical writing in the English language. Although much of the text may have come from other sources, the treatise indicates that Chaucer was versed in science in addition to his literary talents. Another scientific work discovered in 1952, Equatory of the Planetes, has similar language and handwriting compared to some considered to be Chaucer's and it continues many of the ideas from the astrolabe. Furthermore, it contains an example of early European encryption. The attribution of this work to Chaucer is still uncertain.